In 2011, my team's business book, Reinventing Fire, rigorously detailed a highly profitable, business-led, low-carbon, non-nuclear American energy future, $5 trillion cheaper than business as usual, and closely matching what's actually happened since. We found that 2010 efficiency technologies fully deployed at historically reasonable speed could save three-fourths of U.S. electricity at a total cost below a cent per kilowatt hour. That's a tenth our average retail price of electricity today. And the potential is now even bigger. But today I'll focus not on that enormous demand side potential, <clears throat> nor on timely use of electricity, which solves the early evening problem referred to and has turned out to be about three times bigger resource than had been thought. Rather, I'll talk about renewables, which have outgenerated U.S. coal or nuclear power since 2020 and now provide over 90 percent of the world's new generating capacity. Nuclear power was historically significant, a fifth of U.S., a tenth of world electricity, but it's now stagnated into an unimportant distraction. In 2020, the global nuclear additions minus retirements were 782 times smaller in capacity and over 230 times smaller in expected annual output than the net additions of renewables. And that mirrored re uh, nuclear's 20 to 40 times smaller investments than renewables. This pattern is strengthening. Renewables met all global electricity demand last year. And the nuclear eclipse is repeating itself nearly worldwide, particularly in China, India, Germany, and Japan. Enormous new uh, nuclear subsidies cannot change these market outcomes, but they do threaten to slow climate protection. So let's see how. How should we compare generation choices? Well, we build coal-fired power plants by counting costs, but not carbon. Nuclear power is now promoted by counting carbon, but not cost. But to protect the climate, we must save the most carbon at the least cost and in the least time, counting all three variables, carbon and cost and time. Carbon free isn't good enough. We also need cheap and fast because costly or slow options save less carbon per dollar or per year than cheaper or faster options and will thus reduce and retard achievable climate protection. Now, many analysts ignore such common sense comparisons of cost and speed, leading to results akin to arguing that since people are hungry, hunger is urgent, and caviar and rice are both food, therefore both caviar and rice are vital to reducing hunger. Since in reality, money and time are both limited, our priorities in feeding people or in providing energy services must be informed by relative cost and speed. Lower cost saves more carbon per dollar, faster deployment saves more carbon per year. We need both those outcomes, but no nuclear power provides neither. In fact, just operating existing nuclear plants generally costs more per kilowatt hour than replacing them with efficiency or renewables. Letting uneconomic reactors exit the market and competitively procuring carbon-free efficiency or renewables instead would save more carbon after a year or two and even more over the long run, not counting avoidable new subsidies. Let me expand Professor Ramana's explanation of why achieving competitive cost with various kinds of small modular reactors or advanced reactors really takes magical thinking. Early SMRs would produce electricity at about twice the cost of today's light water reactors, because as a matter of physics, reactors don't scale down well. And today's light water reactors, according to Lazard, are three to eight times costlier than modern renewables, or about five to 10 times costlier than on-site efficiency. But by the time SMRs, if successful, could begin mass production, their carbon-free rivals, efficiency and renewables, are set to get another twofold cheaper based on observed learning curves, which nuclear power has never demonstrated. So just do the math, two times three to eight times two means mass production would have to make SMRs about 12 to 32 times cheaper 
or using Bloomberg's cost figures 20 to 52 times cheaper. Neither range is remotely plausible. Mass production simply will not get you there. So SMRs can't catch up because small modular renewables, the other SMRs which do scale down well, have decades of head start in exploiting their own formidable economies of scaling and learning. Novel kinds of reactors or fuel cycles offer no escape because even if the minor nuclear part of the prohibitive total capital cost of today's reactors were free, if you had free nuclear steam, the non-nuclear remainder would still be about two to six times too costly. Nor could SMRs even be developed and scaled fast enough to help much before renewables have already decarbonized the grid anyway. So substituting SMRs for renewables and efficiency would make climate change worse. A climate non-solution isn't worth paying for, let alone extra. Let me end by summarizing why traditional so-called baseload generation by big, lumpy, inflexible thermal plants is no longer needed or desirable or economic. To keep the grid reliable while supply becomes renewable, we can use not just one grid flexibility resource, bulk storage drawn in magenta here, but at least 10 kinds sketched here in order of increase in cost. Your actual cost will vary, but bulk storage comes last, not first, so we needn't wait for a storage miracle and the market isn't waiting. Now, more variable output as we get more wind and photovoltaics does require careful operation, but this is a solved problem. We already have an ample portfolio of cost-effective ways to balance grids on all required time scales. We didn't know now the exact mix we'll use in the 2040s, as climatologist Ken Caldera says, controversies about how to handle the end game should not overly influence our opening moves. Consider the Texas grid, a tough case with no big hydro dams and only 1% interstate connections. In 2050, Texas summer weeks expected loads can get much smaller and less peaky with efficient use. Then we can make 86% of the annual electricity with wind and photovoltaics and 14% from dispatchable renewables. This 100% renewable supply can then be matched to the load by putting the surplus electricity into two kinds of distributed storage worth buying anyway, high storage air conditioning and smart charging electric autos, and then recovering that energy when needed and filling the last gaps with unobtrusively flexible demand. With only about 5% left over uh, to help decarbonize the rest of the economy, the economics should be excellent. And Oregon's hydropower, of course, would make this far easier than it is in Texas. Some grid operators do such choreography today. Germany and Britain are half renewably powered and already at least five European countries with modest or no hydropower are meeting about half to three fourths or more of their electric needs from renewables, adding no bulk storage and with superior reliability for Denmark and Germany about five times ours. The ultra reliable former East German utility 50 Hertz is over half wind and solar powered and they expect 100% renewables reliably integrated by 2032. So as my colleague Clay Stranger says, the operators have learned to run these grids the way a conductor leads the symphony orchestra no instrument plays all the time, but the ensemble continuously makes beautiful music. I'm confident that Oregon can do the same once the rest of the state catches up with EWIN. So thank you for your kind attention, and I'm looking forward to our discussion.